Today, I'm going to sketch out some ideas from the first chapter of Ibram X. Kendi's book, How to Be an Anti-Racist. Let's get into it. Hello and welcome to Verbal to Visual. I am your host, Doug Neal. And part of the reason that I like sketch noting is that it's a skill that helps with two things in particular. One, understanding new ideas, and two, bridging the gap between idea and action. And when it comes to racism in the United States, there's a lot that we white people in particular have to learn so that we can make sure that our actions are part of the solution. With that, let me share some ideas that that I found to be particularly helpful from the first chapter of Kendi's book. The first chapter of How to Be an Anti-Racist focused on a couple of things. The start of Kendi's personal story, and then some really helpful definitions. And here's why this was important for Kendi. Definitions anchor us in principles. This is not a light point. If we don't do the basic work of defining the kind of people we want to be in language that is stable and consistent, we can't work towards stable, consistent goals. So I'm gonna to try to bring some of those definitions together into this diagram here, starting with the definition of racial inequity, which is when two or more racial groups are not standing on approximately equal footing. Kendi shares a couple of health-related examples. The fact that the life expectancy of the average white person Person is 78.9 years, whereas for the black person it's 75.4. That's three and a half years of life on average for every single person. And there's also a distinct contrast in child mortality rates. It's disturbing that child mortality among black infants is twice that of white infants. And more recently, pulling in data from late May, the COVID-19 mortality rate for black people is over twice that of white people. So the goal then, of course, is to move from that racial inequity to racial equity, which is when two or more racial groups are standing on relatively equal footing. So how did we get to this situation and how do we get out of it? And here, Kendi encourages us to focus on racist policy, as opposed to terms like institutional racism, structural racism, and systemic racism. Those terms obscure the fact that the racial inequities that we currently face are due to racist policies of the past. That inequity isn't inherent to all institutions and structures and systems. It's there because people put it there, through racist policies that can be overturned. And to get specific here, a racist policy is any measure that produces or sustains racial inequity between racial groups. As an example of a racist policy from the past, we can look at mandatory minimums. In the mid-80s, two very different sentencing guidelines came out from the federal government. For crack cocaine, which was more prominent in the black community, it only took five grams to get you a mandatory sentence of five years. On the other hand, for powder cocaine, more prominent in the white community, it took 500 grams to get that same minimum sentence of five years, despite the fact that there's no significant difference between crack and powder cocaine. A new law in 2010 fixed that problem, but just think about how many lives were affected in the two and a half decades that it was in place. In contrast to a racist policy, an anti-racist policy is any measure that produces or sustains racial equity between racial groups. So these are policies that actively try to create racial equity or policies that maintain racial equity where it currently exists. So our work then is to get to know very deeply the racial inequities that exist and put into place those anti-racist policies that address it. Now, in addition to there being racist policies and anti-racist policies, there is also such a thing as racist inaction. And two phrases in particular stand out to me, the phrases I don't see color and all lives matter. And the reason that those statements represent racist inaction is because it sustains the inequity that is clearly in front of us. And this is where a helpful line is drawn. There is no such thing as race neutral or non-racist. There are only racist actions and anti-racist actions. There's no middle ground. And hitting home that point, Kendi says, the most threatening racist movement is not the alt-right's unlikely drive for a white ethno-state, but the regular American's drive for a race-neutral one. 
From there, Kendi goes on to talk about racial discrimination, when defined as treating, considering, or making a distinction in favor of or against an individual based on that person's race, racial discrimination is not inherently racist. The defining question is whether that discrimination is creating equity or inequity. If it's creating equity, then it's anti-racist discrimination. If it's creating inequity, it's racist discrimination. Which makes sense because if we treat every single person exactly equally all of the time, nothing about this current state of inequity is going to change. And finally, I appreciated how Kendi ended this chapter thinking about these labels of anti-racist and racist, not as something that you are stuck with, but more as a name tag that you earn with each action that you take. One anti-racist action does not make you an anti-racist for life. You have to keep earning it day after day. Similarly, past racist actions don't have to leave you with a tattoo of racist. You get to pull off that label by making your next action anti-racist. So these are some of the ideas from just the first chapter of how to be an anti-racist that stood out to me. It was helpful for me to summarize them within this diagram. I hope you found it helpful as well. And I encourage you to read and sketch note and put into practice these ideas alongside me. Below this video, you will find a link to How to Be an Anti-Racist, as well as a full anti-racist book list that Kendi put together for the New York Times. And I feel like it's important to point out that when this book was published just a year ago, George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and Ahmaud Arbery were alive. They're dead because we didn't do anything to fix the policies that led to their murder. So I invite sketchnoters in general, white sketchnoters in particular, to help fix the problem. Talk to you in the next one.